I suspect we know what's so special about this rail but I think nonetheless it is really important for us to understand the purpose of God with Israel and how he has been so heavily involved in the uh, nation of Israel ever since the call of Abraham. Uh, Tel Aviv is a new city on the uh, Mediterranean coast that at one time in the uh, late 30s, 40s was a desert but now is a bustling city and maybe the, sh the change that's taken place there is uh, a bit like a metaphor for what God has been doing with the uh, nation of Israel throughout time. The prophet, Jeremiah, the prophet Moses actually talking to the Jews uh, just prior to their entry into the land of promise says of the land that the eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of it. God has always been focused upon that land even before the call of Abraham and so of itself that is a sufficient reason to uh, uh, understand why Israel is special and there is a, a long and, and turbulent history associated with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the uh, land of, uh, of Canaan uh, as it was the land of Israel as it became uh, when they were taken captive and returned and then finally scattered and dispersed and then in the lifetime of many of us in this room came back to a land that was their own and uh, all those events were actually prophesied in scripture and we can look at scripture and see their fulfillment highlighting that God has always been involved in this land. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26 spoken uh, at Sinai, uh, Deuteronomy 28 at the border of the land uh, are complementary chapters which talk about what was going to happen to uh, God's people, the Jews, throughout time. We might, as an aside, make the point that the creator of the universe said what was going to happen because he was in control. He is in control of world affairs. And uh, the ominous and sad uh, fact of what Leviticus and Deuteronomy both say is that God was going to scatter the Jews. More than once he was going to scatter them throughout the nations of the world. Uh, but as we read in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 30 verse 11, God wasn't going to make a full end of them. And that, I think is the point that we really need to hold on to uh, in our own understanding that, you see, the nation of Israel are the evidence that, uh, and evidence that God exists and is working today. But it's a very powerful argument to use with our, uh, anybody that we, we come across who wonders whether they should believe in a God they can't see. You say, well, see the evidence. So God said he would scatter them uh, throughout the, the nation more than once. Uh, and so moving on very quickly to the time that well, what as Christadelphians we call Judah's Commonwealth ended in AD 70 uh, when Rome, the, Ro the power of the Roman uh, Empire uh, finally destroyed the city of Jerusalem, the temple, and uh, sent Jews all over the world as slaves, just as actually Je Moses in Deuteronomy had said. There were so many of them that, well, they were to a penny as we would say today. Nobody would buy them as, a, as the prophet said, as Moses said. Now, the normal human way things go when a nation is dispossessed like that it ceases to exist it doesn't have any identity at all uh, there were Jews in the land until around about AD 132 when 
uh, a prophecy that Micah made uh, was fulfilled. Micah talks about Jerusalem being ploughed as a field and uh, this actually happened when Hadrian, the Hadrian of Hadrian's wall fame uh, finally scattered the Jews from Jerusalem and ploughed the city as a field and struck a coin which has on one hand side the, the face uh, of the emperor the other side a man driving a plough and it was to commemorate the destruction of Jerusalem and Jerusalem was rebuilt as a non-Jewish Roman outpost and that should humanly speaking have been the end of the Jewish people but from AD 132 right through to the 1800s Jews were identifiable in society you could recognize a Jew even though because of persecution they sought to be assimilated into the uh, country they had moved they were still recognizable as Jews that is interesting because one would have thought naturally speaking they would have lost their separate identity because of their willingness to assimilate and it would have reduced the persecution they thought but time rolled on and the Jews continued to be visible without a nation, without a land, without a king, without a language until there was in fact well there have been books written uh, about the uh, amazing fact that there is the wandering Jew right throughout time people have pondered sociologists have pondered how come these people the Jews haven't been assimilated but are recognized as Jews that the wandering Jews books written about them it isn't as if throughout 2000 years they had this wonderful idea we're, we are going to return to our own land Ezekiel 37 has the, the how, how they thought of themselves our hope is lost you know we've got nothing and yet they clung on to their Jewishness I find that re it's really interesting that it doesn't fit with what you would expect that's why books were written about it because it was a phenomenon that was unexpected but the prophet Jeremiah actually does say that they would not be assimilated we read this in Jeremiah 30 verse 11 I will not make a full end of thee though I make a full end of all nations I will not make a full end of thee so God had spoken the Jews were not going to be assimilated they were not going to lose their identity so we know why the Jews continued to uh, exist as an identifiable population even though they hadn't got a country or hadn't got a language hadn't got a king nothing to hold them together but they were held together by well, what were they held together by the fact God had said they would be and so we have a man who comes onto the scene in 1886 and there's this Jew who happened to be a uh, journalist so he had writing skills wrote a book Der Judenstadt the Jewish state and he had a vision and uh, his vision was of the formation of a national home for the Jewish people secured by law and so because of his objectives and, and desired he organized the first Zionist Congress and it was their stated objective was to establish a, in Palestine a home for the Jewish people notice in Palestine not anywhere else yeah. where they uh, he saw that the future see the forlorn and vain hope that he was voicing in fact he received opposition uh, for his plan he was going to hold the uh, first Zionist Congress in Germany but he didn't in the end he held it in Switzerland because of the opposition from where did the opposition come actually it came from the Jewish people 
Jews opposed the idea of there being a national home for the Jewish people secured by law. So what we will see, what we have seen and what we will continue to see is the idea of a Jewish state coming to existence has been fraught with difficulties. It isn't as if everybody has always wanted it to happen. But God did. God dictated it would happen and he would make sure it did. And that's important for us to understand that the, the coming about of the Jewish state, looking back, seems so natural. But in fact it wasn't. It was resisted and opposed by the very people who would have benefited. So much so that uh, it's, it's amazing, you think about this, that despite they, they laid out very clear and very specific objectives as to what they were going to uh, achieve in, in that land of Israel, um, and they're all, from a, from a worldly point of view, really laudable objectives. Um, it didn't have the support of the world. So in fact a world-renowned uh, historian Sir Hugh Trevor Roper uh, in a lecture he gave a professor of modern history at Oxford before he died uh, and he gave a lecture to, right at the end of his career and he made a number of points. You can actually get the whole of this lecture and download it on the internet but he makes the point the politicians, geopoliticians, could have foreseen the continue, continued colonization, colonization of the US. But who could have foreseen the creation of the State of Israel? This historian said, who would have thought it? He said, we might like it or not, but we can't deny that the, it's an extraordinary historical achievement. It's extraordinary that there is a State of Israel, he said. And then he, he looks at what the British statements, statesmen were thinking uh, when they were looking for a home for the Jews and thinking of the consequences of these things. Yeah. As, time, as time goes on, you don't know the consequences of what's going to happen. God did, of course. Geopoliticians couldn't have thought through the consequent transformation of the Middle East and the Islamic Revolution in our day. And they, they go hand in hand. It isn't as if the formation of the State of Israel is unconnected to the Islamic Revolution or the Palestinian problem or whatever we might think. They're all interconnected but weren't foreseen. That's the point that Sir Hugh Trevor Roper was making. And uh, so he says towards the end of his lecture, the development of the State of Israel is a phenomenon which could have been predicted, but it never was. Well, actually it was, but not by geopoliticians. It was predicted by God, time and time and time again. We're familiar with the passages. We can multiply them out over and over again. I will cause you to return to your own land, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, twice in Ezekiel. No doubt that they're going to go back to their own land. I remember actually having a conversation bef before I was baptised actually with a fellow I worked with who was a, a, an atheist and enthused by talks on Bible prophecy to do with the Jews. I would talk to him at work and said the Jews return to the land of Israel is in fulfilment of Bible prophecy. Well the Bible doesn't say that he says but it's so glaring from the, from the pages of the scripture that they're going to return to their own land and it happened but it wasn't a smooth journey right um, in 1909 1903 was the Uganda plan which we will have heard of nobody will remember it uh, but uh, when Britain uh, controlled the largest part of Africa there was an idea to form a national home for the Jews in Uganda. Well, that's a good idea. We're, we're, these people need a home. We'll give them your country. Well, nothing happened. It didn't. It didn't uh, develop into a uh, a state for Israel. But it isn't for want of trying. 
that's the point we need to understand um, the Zionist Congress in 1903 Herzl said we can't reject the, the idea of Uganda it's uh, a, a, a definite possibility that we're being offered yeah. and this is the man who said a national home for the Jews in Palestine we should review this idea he said and in fact it was and then and has ever been since the biggest uh, division biggest conflict within the Zionist movement you know, there ever has been <coughs> it was 295 in favour 178 against accepting Uganda and the 100 abstention so so the offer was there but the Jews didn't want it. Who was behind that, do we think? But it wasn't the first time that the Jews had been offered a national home around the world. In South America, you've got a number of places starting in 1652. Jews offered uh, a national home in, in various countries. Uh, and we do know that Jews are settled in places like Argentina and, and Brazil, but no colony was formed. Or in North America, uh, you've got various locations that have been suggested and uh, offered as national homes for the Jewish people. Or elsewhere in the world, a whole number of places offered for the Jews. Can you think of any other nation that have been offered national homes in probably 15 or 20 different countries around the world? No. Can you think of another nation, 2,000 years after it was scattered, has maintained enough of a separate identity for people to be thinking, these people need a homeland? Well, no. But God has said, though I make a full end of all nations with I have scattered thee, I will not make an end of thee. So we move on to near a time, but still before my time, the time of the world, First World War, when... Uh, one aspect of the, of the First World War was Britain was uh, pitted against the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire uh, controlled the largest part of the Middle East and certainly controlled the land of Palestine as it was then. And we remember the point that the Most High rules in the Kingdom of Men and gives it to whomsoever he will. It's against that background that a Christophian John Thomas said when the newspapers were presenting this picture of the Middle East looking like that that there's going to be a national home for the Jews in Palestine How, why did he say that? not because the media said it but because the Bible said it so he was only echoing things that uh, had been said by people like Sir Isaac Newton hundreds of years before that the Bible predicted the return of the Jews to the land of Palestine and so during the First World War. Remember, during the war, Britain had no idea how long the First World War would last. But there was the Balfour Declaration, and we can we can explain rationally why the British government was willing to do this because of the help that various uh, Jews had given, particularly in the making of acetone. His Majesty's government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. That sounds great. Until you read the compromises and the wooliness written into it. There was this desire, but uh, establishment in Palestine of a national home. It's not the national home, but anyway, it was a major step forward in these things. And doubtless there will be Christadelphians really enthusiastic about that declaration which is now a hundred years old and uh, in 1917 on my birthday but many years before my birthday Allenby liberated Jerusalem uh, another step in the establishment of a Jewish homeland yeah. and so things seem to be going the right way but then there were hiccups, hiccup after hiccup after hiccup. In 1937 there was the Peel Commission and what did it suggest? Partition the land, give the Jews a little bit and the Arabs a large part 
of the uh, land. The Arabs rejected it. But notice 1937, solution to tension in, Jeru in the land of Israel, partition the land, divide it up. What are they talking about today? Dividing the land. Yeah. Interesting. The solution that man came up with in 37 still hasn't actually brought fruit, come to fruition. Yeah. It's as if the way that man thinks about solving a problem forces the situation into the world's uh, consciousness because of the wars and troubles that go on in the Middle East. Anyway, the Peel Commission, nothing really came of it, but then we have the Holocaust. Only a few, a few years later, the, the Jews hounded out, murdered, massacred, as were others, by the Germans. And again, back in Deuteronomy, the promise was there, ominous warning from God. Thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. Thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning you'll say, would God, God it was evening, and in the evening, would God it was morning for fear. And it was an awful thing. But it seems that that very atrocity, when it became known, <coughs> galvanised the nations and galvanised Jews to think about a national home. So in 1948, the state of Israel was declared. And we've probably all heard the recording that was made at the time and rejoiced. But we need to remember it was a fulfilment of Bible prophecy. I will call you to return to your own land. But even thereafter, it hasn't been a smooth journey. Israel had to fight for its existence. Um, going back in time for a moment or two and thinking about different things that were uh, discussed. In 1939, preempted in the end by the war, you have a conference, St James Conference, about the Jews and partitioning the land no solution. Likewise in 1939 well we're not going to allow Jews to go into the land of uh, Palestine. Um, then in 1947 the UN calls for two independent states, two subordinate states. I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone the prophet says. So things seem to be going wrong again. You know Norman and I had the pleasure Yes, of uh, being given a tour of the UN building in New York uh, a few years ago and on the wall there was a map with coloured pins in it and the, the guide that was explaining what it was all about was pointing out there are two places in the world where there has been conflict ever since the formation of the UN only two Lots of places where there have been conflicts that have been resolved after a fashion. Two places in the world. You can name one of them. Maybe you can name two. Or maybe you're asleep. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Korea. Nope. One is the Middle East. The other is India, Pakistan. Now, how often do you hear about conflict between India and Pakistan <coughs> nowadays? And you don't. It's just not in the news. How often do we hear about conflict in the Middle East? It's always there. As if God is focusing the world's attention on what he's doing there. But the point is, the, the, even the UN can't resolve the problems that are in the Middle East. Israel has survived wars you know, against all the odds. The uh, Jews have actually uh, survived the War of Independence. And I can't help but think that during the... Uh, vote that UN took on the partition uh, on the establishment of the state of Israel whether there were countries thinking oh we'll vote them into existence because they're going to be wiped out pretty soon you know but we've got a series of wars and conflicts and troubles ever since that have focused upon Israel um, Norma made the observation to me I think uh, around the first Gulf War you probably saw, you might even remember, 
the images of that massive statue of Saddam Hussein being dragged to the ground. It was pointing. And there were loads of them all over. <coughs> and they were all pointing to Jerusalem. So I don't think even the Gulf War wasn't related, fundamentally related to. But it's not been a smooth journey. That's the point I, I want us to understand. That's what's so special because it's not followed what historians would have expected to happen. I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whether I have scattered thee, yet will I make, not make a full end of thee. That's what Jeremiah says. Yeah. I will bring you again to your, the place which, where I cause you to be carried away captive. You know, they are got to go back to their own land. And so we're teeming six million now in the land. He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. But there they are in unbelief against all the odds against all expectation because God said it would happen um, I think it was good that I was born in 1947 and came across Christadelphians in 1966 because in 1968 66 it was not that long since the formation of the state of Israel and there were lots of talks about the the uh, fulfilment of Bible prophecy with respect to the Jews that really enthused me and excited me. Um, but now, 50 years down the line, I've spoken to 40 year olds who from their perspective Israel has always been there. I didn't realise Israel was a new nation. And these are Christadelphians. And it makes me think a little bit about Israel as they're coming out of Egypt. When you come out of Egypt under Moses and the Red Sea is parted and the Egyptians are destroyed and you've got a pillar of cloud, a pillar of fire, it's quite awe-inspiring. Just like the formation of the state. But after a few years of this in the wilderness, oh, cloud's always there in the morning eh? and the fire's always there at night. I know what it was like in Egypt, but this has always been like this now. But if you've been born in the wilderness and you're now 35 years on, well, what's so special? It's always there, isn't it? And familiarity can dull the senses. And I suppose, given the audience we've got, my plea would be don't be dull, have your senses dulled by the fact that Israel's been there for a long time. And maybe teach our children that go through Sunday school and learn about the promises and learn about Israel's history. Teach them that but there was a long period of time when there weren't any Jews in the land of Israel and now the return is something special. It seems to me the flag of Israel today is like our um, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire. And I would say to those that weren't baptised, are you a a disinterested bystander, you know, oh, isn't that interesting? Or are we heirs of the promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? We know he keeps his word. Fulfilled prophecy with respect to the nation of Israel is the evidence that God keeps his word. Time has gone, time has passed, but the ultimate fulfilment of these promises is that Abraham is going to be a father of many nations. The promises will be fulfilled through his seed and that seed will include you and I through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I suppose what we should be thinking about this special nation, God's chosen people, are a witness to us that God was at work, is at work and will continue to work to bring about the fulfilment of his promises. I suspect we know what's so special about Israel but I think nonetheless it is really important for us to understand the purpose of God with Israel and how he has been so heavily involved